I don't miss his breath, stinking of beer and dry roasted peanuts, nor his spittle dribbling on my collarbone, bruised where it wouldn't show. Now I am an outdoor bird, a magpie watching daybreak's dew, the drizzle of an English summer cooling my healing neck as the park gates swing open at one or another end of my favourite bus route, the 188 from Greenwich to Russell Square. I suppose it'll be harder when the weather turns. <laughs> Daft cow, Stanley laughed, and I could tell from our chauffeur's wobbling shoulders that he too considered me an object of ridicule. All I'd said was, oh, I didn't know the big sales now start as early as November, as we cruised along Oxford Street, passing Selfridges and John Lewis, still all a glitter at midnight. The joke was that I'd mistaken the dismay of ragbag rough sleepers for bargain hunters. Why else might someone curl up on the hard ground outside a department store? Stanley laughing was a bad sign. Too often his chuckles tended to slither into sneers and slaps. I had learnt it was best to say nothing, to ask nothing, for I did indeed need nothing. I belonged beside the Arga, while the city was Stanley's domain. Up west was not for the likes of me, apart from the annual November hell of a Masonic ladies' night. Ironically, it was an overnight Masonic jamboree that gave me the idea. All the wives had a spa session, while their other halves bared their calves in ceremonial bonding games. Embarrassed by my lump and flesh, I declined massages and the like, but found delight in hiding my flab in the steam room or submerged in the glorious hot tub before huddling beneath a fluffy free white towel upon a lounger. I fell asleep, and when I woke up I thought, I could live like this. My sleep used to be pocked with anger, fear and worry. The worst dreams were the happy ones, waking from bliss into a bruised chaos that stung like a raw finger dipped into a salt and vinegar packet of crisps I once found abandoned on a memorial bench dedicated to Robin, who so loved it here. When I was a child, a meagerly shod, scruffy tramp occasionally knocked on our back door to beg for a glass of water. He'd pilfer whatever lay within a hand snatch while Mum's back was turned at the sink. He favoured oranges. Mum taught me that whilst a good deed a day keeps the hubris away, one should never leave a purse on the kitchen table. I suppose I was lucky to have been brought up in a penny-pinching household where meals were planned to the last splinter of cheddar. Like my mother, I have become an obsessive planner. Scrumped apples alone do not make a pie. I have not yet resorted to stealing, although I have been known to liberate some biscuits and ballpoint pens from a hotel's amenities trolley. My incredulity at the vagrants in the big city seems less funny now that I too am homeless. I was never mighty, as in, look how that mighty Pamela's fallen, but I was certainly a languisher with a body grossly swollen from baked goods munched in solitude. It was when I started planning that I realised I had no friends. I'd had nodding acquaintances before our son was exiled to boarding school, but Stanley discouraged close friends. I was hardly a lady of leisure lazybones like those my mother did for, Maintaining a mansion fit for a mogul was a complex job, what with keeping an eye on the cleaners and gardeners and deliveries. Stanley preferred me to personally cook our evening meal and his full English breakfast. Each morning I would wave him off like a 1950s housewife, 
swapping his briefcase for a peck on the cheek, hoping he'd have a good day at the office. And I hoped it fervently, because the times his day at the office were less than good, my evenings were bad. I once overheard Stanley talking to a young man at one of the lodge dinners. Take my advice, Stanley said. Find a girl like my Pamela. Plain as a pike staff, with meaty thighs and a docile nature. She'll not cost you a fortune in designer gear, nor be a flirty flippity gibbet at cricket club tees. You want a wife like a basset hound. Loyal, faithful, and too fat to run too far. Ha! <laughs> run? Me? The more his bonuses abounded, the more I settled into the fog of affluence and accepted gratefully my son sliding away from Stanley's control. Currently, James does important work in a Ghanaian medical centre where kindness trumps gold taps and wine cellars. Stanley abhors this altruistic lifestyle. They will not have been in contact. I do email James occasionally from the library, and though his replies are curt, at least I know he's well. Where most down and outs go wrong is failing to plan. Surely they must have had some warning, and at least a smidgen of breathing space? Or were they too consumed by hope to admit their sorrows? Or, or did they one day just snap, turn and walk? I spent days scheming like a novelist plotting a story arc. And once I made the decision, recognising the futility of continuing, the thrill of planning took over. My choice was to sink or swim. So I decided to swim, literally. I've always felt safe in our swimming pool, well, any swimming pool. As a fat child whose perspiration defeated cheap deodorants, swimming was the only exercise that didn't leave me with the odour of stale sweat. It wasn't so bad at infant school, being porky pammy, but when, after puberty, my nickname changed to Stinky Porky Pammy. I took action and the swimming pool became my sanctuary. So, no doubt to the surprise of my schoolmates, I was lithe when Stanley claimed me at the Palais on Ilford High Road. I'm not a classic hobo. I don't shuffle. I keep my head up and my clothes are not a Guy Fawkes jumble. My flaccid days watching daytime television had educated me into cash converting, and so the proper gold jewellery, albeit given to me by Stanley for appearances, allowed me to pay in cash for my membership and a year's rental on the permanent locker at the health club. So. I've no need to trundle my worldly goods around the streets in a shopping trolley. I reckon that making a leisure club my home, with its inclusive fresh towels, is far better than, say, camping out at an airport. And I found a great deal at a chain motel near Euston. £20 a night if a dozen separate stays were booked in advance. I thus have a room for the first Sunday of each month and Christmas Day. Sheets, duvet and somewhere to properly freshen my clothes. A treat to keep me going. That left me with just under a thousand pounds, which equals 20 pounds a week for a year's food. I spent the last 10 nights in the house practicing doing without sleep as opposed to not sleeping. Wakefulness is the key to survival. Just as successful tycoons and world leaders are known to function effectively with little sleep, I taught myself to manage with a succession of catnaps. After all, I have neither a country nor a corporation to run. Only a month 
after my epiphany in the spa, while Stanley was away on a weekend business trip, I left a note on the hall table, accompanied by the SIM card from my phone and the low limit credit card he'd granted me for minor expenses. I left my laptop, having first wiped all his history, and the emails concerning the hardest of all my planning, acquiring my Freedom Pass, the only way Stanley could trace me, if he could be bothered. <laughs> I've amazed myself with my talent for deviousness. Stanley, the word dear, not appropriate, I have left. I want nothing from you. You may divorce me after two years. I repeat, I want nothing but to be rid of you. And, reader, I left him. I also left the door of the freezer open. <laughs> Childish, I know. <laughs> and forgot to set the burglar alarms. Five months, two weeks, four days since I walked. And walked and then took the bus. It was more sensible than walking. I ride the 38 to the British Museum, the 74 to the Victoria and Albert, the 25 goes east, the 171 crosses the river, and I adore the 168 to Primrose Hill, and sometimes, with only five changes over several hours, I can inhale cockles warming my heart on Brighton Beach. Most of my life is stored in locker 27 within a women's changing room. And I am the fittest I've ever been. Arriving at the gym as soon as it opens at six, I catnap in a cubicle for an hour until I hear the cleaner singing her arrival. I shower, rinse my underwear, spinning it in the swimsuit dryer, shaking my knickers beneath the hairdryer. I watch morning television, on the recliner bicycle's inbuilt screen, and in the early evening I might watch a soap opera or, or even a documentary as I pound a running machine. I've even been known to swing a few dumbbells. My bingo wings have vanished, and a waist unseen for over 30 years now nestles beneath my diminishing bosoms. I swim whenever I want, doze in the steam room, swelter in the sauna, and luxuriate in the jacuzzi. After each shower, I wrap myself in a free white towel. The club has a small cafe providing free cucumber flavoured water and daily newspapers. The staff, as in so many establishments, is lackadaisical. So I, being a helpful lady, subtly clear tables, sliding edible remnants upon a serviette. If anyone notices, no one cares. The great thing about having dumped one's pride is lack of boundaries. Like the hobo from my childhood, I have learned to pilfer. Today's breakfast was dregs of orange juice, a quarter of a muffin, and a barely touched bowl of muesli, abandoned by a waif with a ballerina's gait. She'd also left a half-slurped milky cup of tea, bitter tea, nasty tea. I prefer coffee, but I am no longer a chooser. Sometimes I suck on sachets of sugar. Daytimes, I scavenge throughout the city from St Christopher's Place behind Oxford Street to the Westfield malls of Stratford and White City with their vast food courts. I spend a pound a day on a bowl of fruit from Chapel Market. I know where all the best sell-by date offers are and have developed a nose for those tube stations where free samples are proffered. Last week at Waterloo, there were cereal bars and navel oranges promoting the eponymous brand of mobile. I will need fresh shoes soon, but have no aversion to rummaging through the charity shops of Kentish Town. A lady of immaculate appearance will be considered eccentric, not derelict. The restroom at the Strand Palace, the 91 from Trafalgar Square, has hand cream to splodge where it chafes. And Phoenix has a splendid array of fine fragrances in its powder room. But Harrods is the best for complimentary makeovers. Although I make do with any of the others. 
72 cosmetic counters within a hair's breadth of Oxford Circus. I feign interest, wait for the assistant to offer, never ask, too obvious, and hey presto, I am moisturised and painted. I enthuse about all the products, but just as I am about to seal the deal, my phone will thwart the sale. <gasps> oh no, how awful! My whisper is tearful. I'll be right over, oh you poor thing! I thank the assistant, and promising to return, I add, I do so loathe funerals. My skin is bright from the fresh air of nighttime walking. My nails are clean, and I smell like crushed rose petals. I have seen the second half of most of the bad shows in Theatreland, and some of the good ones too. Once I picked up a ticket dropped by a gentleman as he dashed into a taxi in Drury Lane, only to find myself sat in a Covent Garden box lavished with canapes and wine. The music was quite jolly too. <laughs> London has over 1,400 hotels, 111 designated five-star. Each evening I camp out in a different opulent lounge. My trick is to sink into a comfy armchair in a quiet corner with a library book in one hand and my inert mobile in the other. Should a member of staff approach, I put my phone to my ear as if answering a silent vibrate. Darling, I'll say in a cut glass accent. Oh dear, don't worry, see you soon. Then I smile wanly. Just some iced tap water for the moment, please. <laughs> On good days, there are bowls of snacks. And sometimes I allow myself to be swept into a wedding or similar buffet-laden function, just like a maiden aunt everyone half recognises. The dead time begins when the hotel lounge is empty and I lose my invisibility. There's a hotel in Baker Street where the ladies is tucked away behind small conference rooms barely used in the evenings, so sometimes, when the rain is hard, I sneak a nap there. But mostly I walk or doze on a night bus, my money belt strapped to my skin. I'm not sure what I will do when my gym membership expires. Other plans bubble, including one with a hint of danger. It's what comes of spending evenings in luxurious hotel lobbies, looking ladylike but with a seductive air of elegant wistfulness. Various gentlemen have glanced my way, but I've yet to give the nod to their wink. Alternatively, given my extensive research into the market, I think I'd make a jolly good hotel receptionist. <laughs>